the next panel is looking at a number of the markets that we've been talking about. Bank markets, non-bank markets, CLOs, leverage loans. It's a big agenda. And I asked Oleg Malentilev of uh, Bank of America Merrill, mainly because of a piece he wrote with his colleagues a little over a year ago, I believe it was. And it was full of great data on the leverage in our system. And while he was very gracious to agree to moderate the session, he really wanted to talk about his data. So what I asked him is, talk about your data, but also be the moderator. And I'll let him introduce uh, the other uh, members of his great panel, uh, some of whom I know, and one of whom was a PhD from Stern. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you're in for a treat. Oleg? Thank you so much. joining us on this panel on um, non-bank lending. My name is Oleg Milantiev, uh, so I run the high yield strategy research at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And uh, I'm joined by um, some, uh, some of the best experts in, in the field. Uh, Mark Carey is a co-president, is a co-president uh, of uh, Global Association of Risk Professionals. He's immediately on my left. Uh, Victoria Vashana is a Lovett learned uh, professor of finance at Harvard University. And Craig Packer on, on the far left from me is a co-founder of All Rock Capital, who is uh, um, a company representing a direct lending platform. So welcome everybody. Uh, just maybe to set the stage, I'll um, provide a few data points to kind of lay, uh, lay of the land in, in corporate credit space. And some of the data points uh, Ed has already provided in, in, in his presentation. Uh, but we're looking at a $10 trillion uh, asset class of non-financial corporate credit in the United States. Um, of, of that total, about a quarter, less than a quarter, 22.5% to be precise, is actually extended by banks. And the rest of it is held and provided by investors, by capital markets. And so in that other category, uh, more than three quarters of total outstanding, we are looking at investment grade and high yield bonds uh, at slightly over $5 trillion total. Broadly syndicated loans is uh, a category that emerged more or less uh, in previous credit cycles, so it's been around for some time at over a trillion dollars. And as I mentioned, um, the private debt, sometimes called as direct lending, is another category that's growing the fastest and exceeds a trillion dollars at this point in time. Um, so just to touch on a few points on the structure, the sort of composition and, and the growth rates in, in, in this space. Uh, first of all, as Ed mentioned in, in his remarks uh, in, a previous, uh, uh, in a previous presentation, this is a 10-year-old credit cycle. So it lasted longer than pretty much any predecessor that we have uh, in modern history. It has seen the most significant increase in debt, in corporate debt in this, in this particular situation. We're going to be discussing just the corporate debt. So this is the left-hand side slide that you see on, on a screen. Um, the line itself measures trailing 12 months uh, dollars, that incremental change in non-financial corporate debt. Um, and as you can see, the 10-year cycle that we are living through right now is, uh, uh, is a $4.3 trillion increase in terms of outstanding amounts. It's, it's a record in dollar terms. It's also a record in, in percentage terms. So if you want to look at it that way and say what this increase represents relative to where things were 10 years ago, it's a 66% increase higher than what we've seen in previous, in previous cycles. Um, as we go through this panel and we go through this presentation, we'll touch on some measures of risk that we're paying attention to. And uh, we'll talk about the extension of duration that we have seen, the um, 
credit quality uh, degradation that we are observing. There are also a lot of questions about liquidity in our markets, about foreign exchange risks, because a lot of investors that are coming to corporate credit in the U.S. today, they come in from overseas. So there is a, a, an element of that as well. So let me um, just give you a couple more data points and then turn it to, uh, to panelists. Uh, in terms of growth rates uh, in, within the non-bank non lending space, the right-hand side chart on, on the screen, we're looking at the dark blue line, which has the longest history. That's the investment-grade corporate bond market. Uh, these are three-year cumulative growth rates, so you can see sort of the shapes and the peaks and the troughs of previous credit cycles uh, on, on, on that longer time horizon. Um, the, the blue line has peaked in, uh, in, in sort of anticipation of the 2000-2001 credit cycle turning and then subsequently uh, coming out of uh, the great financial crisis in 08 and 09. The yellow line is the uh, high yield bond market, which remarkably, compared to everything else that we've seen in, in uh, non-financial corporate space, is the only line that has been actually contracting for the last few years. So of all the places in our universe and in corporate space, uh, high yield bond market is actually the only place that has been relatively disciplined. Part of the reason is a lot of that activity has just simply transitioned to other markets. So you can see that light shaded blue line, which is a broadly syndicated loan market that has been growing uh, kind of in a healthy way. Uh, and then the orange line, right? That's the one that's gets a lot of attention uh, more recently. That's the private debt category, um, which has recently peaked at 70% growth rate. Again, just to remind you, this is a percent of uh, uh, outstanding three years ago, so a three-year cumulative growth rate. So by far, the peaks that we are currently observing on the orange line exceeds anything else that we've seen in any other category of corporate credit. Uh, the dollar terms, as I mentioned, behind that orange line is about a trillion dollars at this point in time. So I'll pause here and uh, maybe turn the question over to Craig, being sort of on the ground practitioner in this space. How do you uh, measure, how do you observe, how do you feel about this market and what do you think the prospects are? Uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, nice to be here. Um, you know, after listening to all the comments, I'm kind of depressed, to be honest with you. <laughs> kind of hard to get up in the morning. Um, look, um, you know, the observation I would make, you know, having lived through the crisis in, in 07, 08, 09, uh, at that time I ran the leverage finance business at Goldman Sachs, is I think one of the biggest differences today versus then is back then, there were not big conferences of people sitting around talking about how, how risky the market was. Um, it was a very complacent time. Um, we talked about the banks. Um, the banks at that time were warehousing a dramatic amount of risk that they had intended to uh, distribute um, to the capital markets. Um, and so I would say the financial system as a whole um, was unprepared for a downturn. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I would suspect if I did today, um, most people walking into the room already had a very cautious, concerned uh, view about where the economy was, where the interest rate cycle was, and what might happen if the economy turns over. It's, it's hard to find folks that are willing to stand up and say, I'm bullish on the markets. All the asset classes are very high levels. Equities, maybe amongst the, amongst, um, the highest. Um, investment grade well, credits, commodities, everything's very high levels. And so I think it's a more sober um, system. I think the lessons of, of the, the, the uh, crisis are still fresh um, in the minds of investors and banks. Um, and so in that, I would point to that um, environment as, as an improvement. Um, the other big factor, which again I think was touched on, is you're in an environment where the central banks around the world are flooding the markets uh, with liquidity. And so when you try to come up with the scenario where the environment turns quickly, um, it's hard to do, um, particularly 
in the U.S. with an election next year, you know, an expectation that things will continue. Having said all that, um, so I, I work in, um, uh, I co-founded a firm called Al Rock Capital. We are um, a direct lender. We're in the private debt markets, which um, it's hard for me to see the chart, but it's one of the, it's the fastest growing area. It's coming from a very small base, so it's a little bit misleading to, uh, to make it seem like that's excessive growth. Um, but the factors behind our growth, we, we make loans directly to companies, primarily backed by private equity firms, although not exclusively. You know, what I would say about our business, just to, just to help juxtapose versus some of the other markets, is that our pool of capital is what we, we would call permanent capital, which means our investors do not have redemption rights. Um, their equity is invested in us, and we perpetually reinvest it and pay a dividend out. So we're not subject to a run, a run on the bank, if you will. We're also very moderately levered. Um, CLOs are generally about 10 times levered. We run at, at less than one time levered. So less leverage, permanent capital, pretty ideally a uh, vehicle to make illiquid loans. And so the fact that we're growing a lot, I think reflects the desire for big pensions um, and endowments um, to try to meet their obligations. And you know what's a little bit lost to all this is there's a, there's a reason why people are pushing for yield, pensions and endowments. They're trying to earn a six, a seven uh, percent return to meet their obligations to their um, um, uh, pension holders, um, policy holders, what have you. Um, and this is one of the few places where, where you can do that. And so what we're doing is we, we agree it's a time to be very cautious, um, but we think there's a way you can earn those rates of return if you have a stable pool of capital and a moderate leverage, and you're not subject to um, having to sell at just the wrong time, which a more a mutual fund format um, would be. So time to be cautious. I think it's a pretty sober market, um, but we are preparing ourselves for that downturn that inevitably will come. And um, the sort of yields that your portfolio generates today, how does that compare in kind of your knowledge to other options, to high yield, to leverage loans? You, you, you are higher in private debt, I assume, but to what extent? Yeah, so, we're, so our funds, um, you know, we, we invest in assets. Um, so we source our loans directly rather than going through an intermediary. Um, the benefit of, one of the benefits of that model is rather than um, an intermediary taking a portion of that fee, you know, we collect that fee, so that boosts our returns. Um, we're generally, we're, we're, we're a secured lender, we invest in floating rate instruments. On average, um, depending upon which fund we manage for funds, um, we're earning a high single digit uh, rate of return on the, on the loans with a little bit of leverage. So we can deliver to our investors a low double digit, high single digit uh, rate of return. Um, now, compare that to the high yield bond market. You, you know, five and a half, six. Five, five and a half percent. And we're 98% senior secured loans. So the top of the capital structure, as opposed to the unsecured bond market, which is you know, the bottom of the capital structure. Great, thank you. A um, Couple of other slides uh, just to, um take this conversation to the next step in terms of how much risks investors are taking in uh, corporate credit. Um, so the left-hand side chart is interesting. Somebody mentioned 100-year bonds being floated around uh, recently. The left-hand side chart is showing you the effective duration of the global bond index. So every single bond in the world that exists today, regardless of currency, regardless of whether it's a sovereign, corporate, financial, non-financial, goes into that index. The index has about $60 trillion of face value outstanding uh, in, in dollar equivalents. That's the effective duration of that index on the left-hand side chart. So investors, credit investors today, are taking pretty much the maximum duration risk for what we know uh, uh, in terms of history happening at the time when interest rates, of course, are uh, close to all-time lows. Uh, Professor Altman touched on the uh, triple B risk. That's the right-hand side uh, on a chart. Uh, you probably have seen different variations of this. We are showing this as uh, triple B as a percent of the high yield market. So directly related to that risk, if you start seeing downgrades, I guess more appropriately, when you start seeing downgrades, we don't know how severe the cycle is going to be. 
but when, when you start at large base, certainly the chances are uh, you're going to be seeing some, um, some pretty significant numbers coming down. Uh, Left-hand side on, on the following page is showing uh, leverage. So this is debt over EBITDA in the high yield market space. So similar to what Ed has presented in terms of uh, relative Z-scores, leverage today is not that different from where it was in 06 and 07 or where it was approaching 2000, 2001, turning the cycle. The caveat to this, of course, is the peaks that you see on this chart, they don't happen because companies decide to relever themselves at the last moment. They happen because EBIT does fall apart in an average recession. So the right-hand side chart is helpful here because it shows you what that sort of average drawdown in EBITDA is. And as you can see, it's natural for that measure to go down about 20 to 30% in the recession. So if a high yield market is levered five times today, assuming an average recession, we're looking at a high yield market at the peak, if it happens tomorrow, levered about six to seven times, basically automatically, without anybody doing anything. And six to seven times from the left-hand side chart, as you can tell, is kind of similar to where previous credit cycles have peaked. So Mark, maybe from your perspective, uh, from risk management perspective, how do you think about uh, this confluence of uh, events and developments? So I'm a risk guy, and one of the mantras in the risk business is, know what you don't know. And I'm going to say a few words about leveraged loans. I'm going to start with what we do know, which is historical experience. So let's steal some numbers from Ed slides and sort of round off to make the arithmetic convenient. So when the next leverage loan downturn happens, let's assume in line with historical experience that over two years, 20% of them are going to default. Okay, that would not be unusual. Okay, and let's assume in line with historical experience that you're going to recover about 75%. That means you're going to lose about 25% of your claim in bankruptcy court. So that means the market is going to lose about five percentage points. That doesn't sound like such a big number compared to the bank capital ratios that Daryl Duffy was showing earlier. And it's not so big compared to CLO capital structures where in the current vintages, you know, they're mostly somewhere around 10% equity. However, the world has changed, okay? The leveraged loans today are not the same as they were historically. So now we're into what we don't know, okay? And what we don't know is what's going to be the impact uh, above all of the changes in covenant packages. Most of the talk is about covenant light and most of that is about debt to a bit to ratios or something similar to that. And, you know, my own instinct is that's not gonna have a big impact on either, on the combination of default and recovery. But there's also been a not very well publicized change in other covenants which essentially protect the lenders against looting by the borrower, okay? And what I mean by that is covenants that prevent the borrower from paying out a large fraction of the value of the firm to the shareholders and then turning it over to the bankruptcy judge 90 days later. Or covenants that prevent the collateral that's securing the leverage loans from being transferred out of their reach. Okay, so let's suppose that traditional loan recovery rates, which were about 75%, become you know, somewhat worse. And the way I'm going to say that is, instead of losing 25%, now you're going to lose 50% on the average loan. Well, now the portfolio is going to lose 10% and the equity tranche in the CLOs. And this is the typical CLO, right? We're not out in the bad tail here. The typical CLO's equity tranche is wiped out. And you're into losses on the rated tranches. The next tranche is typically a double B tranche, and it's only good for about two percentage points. The next tranche after that is investment grade, okay? I think it's single A, typically, okay? Or the combination of the triple B and the single A is another six percentage points or so. So, you know, I don't know what the impact 
of the changes in the contracts on recovery rates and default <coughs> rates. I haven't said anything about default rates being worse, okay, but I'm convinced recovery rates will be worse. If they're worse than 50%, which is better than the average bond recovery rate, that's really bad news for the investment grade tranches in the CLOs. Remember how difficult it was in 2008 in all of the structured credit markets, right? When there was a lot of uncertainty what was going to happen with the underlying instruments and who was going to take losses. How difficult will it be to issue in the structured credit markets, not only the CLO market but other markets, because there's now uncertainty about the ability of the rating agencies to properly rate the various tranches. So, you know, I'm not predicting awful things will happen, but the world has changed, and the changes only point one way, which is a bad way. And so I think there could be substantial transmission from the financial markets to the real economy <laughs> next time, whenever that is. Much as in the last three recessions, basically the financial markets has caused the recession. It was not the Fed increasing interest rates. It was problems in the financial markets in 1991, you know, in 2000, 2001, and certainly in 07 to 09. So, you know, I'm pessimistic, uh, but it's not too late to do something about it because the loans get reissued all the time, and if the covenant packages just get improved, maybe we'll go back to history and everything will be what we know. Thank you. Victoria, I know you've done a lot of work on covenants. Um, maybe as an extension of Mark's remarks, any particular, there is a number of covenants that are being lost, right? And it all started 10 years ago when people gave away the maintenance covenant, which over time, I think the whole industry kind of came to conclusion that wasn't such a big deal, that covenant really didn't mean that much because a lot of issuers were getting waivers when they were hitting through that covenant. But as Mark mentioned, some of the more recent examples are potentially more problematic, and maybe you can describe some of those. Sure. Um, not surprisingly, the covenants that we should be paying attention are the ones that are hard to measure. Right? So we've been tracking covenant lightness because it's rather objectively and easily measured, and we have a historical series of it, and so we can compare it across time. But the problem with a loan contract is that it's a dense, very dense, very uh, detailed document where replacing one word such as senior secured debt to total debt instantly changes economics of the creditors. So with that in mind, there is, of course, uh, constraints, restrictions on liens, restrictions on indebtedness, restrictions on asset sales, uh, and several other restrictions which basically protect the senior secured position. And Craig emphasized that keep in mind that, that via senior secured, of course, he's not in the leveraged loan segment. But anything that protects you as a senior secured, and it's in the words, right? You are on the top of the position and you secured, so you have a claim on the collateral. So those are the things to pay attention to. And I think that the retail sector, so there is no, now, way exactly do you pay attention is very tricky. You, those are the key categories, and uh, precisely because this is a, a delicate legal language where replacement of very few words can have such substantial meaning. Uh, that's what makes it complex, and that's what, why precisely we're paying attention to financial covenants, where we can more or less distinguish things. And an illustration of recent problems you can uh, uh, well presented to us by the distress in retail sector, right? And that doesn't mean that the potential problems are limited to that, but it's a clear illustration of it. And of course, the most notorious case was a J.Crew case, right, where. Uh, the senior secured position was eroded by the collateral, the, the primarily the brand of J. Crew being removed in terms of unrestricted subsidiary. So this is a basically dilution of the of the claim on the collateral. And uh, following the J. Crew, there were several other uh, companies that replicated that specific transaction, so, meaning that that specific specific provision was throughout the contracts. But it's hard to say this is the only piece that we need to take 
to pay attention to. It's a broad range of covenants. They are not financial covenants. They are general restrictions that are intended to protect your senior secured position as a creditor. Right. So can I, uh, can I? Of course. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little experiment. <laughs> Who knows what the biggest covenant light market is? Any guesses? Bond market. Bond market. Which part of the bond market? High yield. No. <laughs> What's that? IG, I guess. I heard it. IG, right? You never hear people talk about the investment grade bond market as being a covenant light market, but as we, covenant light is a big topic and, um, and it's easy to understand why, but I, I think that the nomenclature um, sometimes glosses over um, what's going on. The investment grade bond market um, has neither maintenance covenants nor incurrence covenants. The high yield bond market has, does, has no maintenance covenants, but it has incurrence covenants. Uh, the leveraged loan market um, has, has moved to a covenant light market, which means it has lost the maintenance covenants, but it has incurrence covenants. Um, and I make that point because calling it covenant light, I think, glosses over just how much of the corporate debt markets are. But I think it's, it's important to understand why this happened. Um, it happened because of the um, the institutionalization um, of the loan market from being a market done by banks uh, to one being bought by financial institutions. If you went back 30, 40 years ago, banks made these loans. Um, and banks had maintenance covenants because they were holding the loan and they wanted to hold their borrowers' feet to the fire. That makes logical sense. Um, I'm not saying this um, to form an opinion one way or the other, but the market moved from banks holding loans to banks arranging loans that were then going to be held by institutions like the bond market, the IG market and the high yield market. Um, as a result of that trend, which is complete, the charts, the charts we showed, banks don't hold loans anymore. Loans are held by, um, by institutions like CLOs and mutual funds. It kind of makes sense if you're a borrower and your loan is going to get held by a hundred different holders, each of which is going to have a tiny piece why you'd be reluctant to agree to um, a covenant that you might have to negotiate across a hundred different holders rather than two to five banks. Um, so it's logical. On the other side, the holder of those loans, um, I think they all are, are smart enough to know they'd prefer to have maintenance covenants. The issue is they're only buying a small piece of every loan. And so the way they're managing the risk that we're referring to is by being extremely diversified and owning a little bit of each loan. Um, and as a result of that, they don't have any purchasing power to change the terms on any one loan. Um, and that's a difficult um, problem to solve. Um, so I agree uh, with the picture that's getting painted, the documentation in the syndicated market um, has gotten very weak. I think the rating agencies, again, I'm not speaking about KBRA specifically, but I think the rating agencies have, have highlighted these concerns uh, because the CLO ratings, you know, CLOs are completely ratings driven. And so the, the ratings are holding up um, despite the fact that the documentation is weaker. And that's what's allowing the market to change. If the ratings changed pretty much overnight, um, the, the buyer base for those loans would dry up. Yes, I'm allowed to comment. So I, it is, it's an excellent point about that one, when we don't pay attention to who is funding the market, we can miss the fact that the leverage loan market maybe should have had a bond in it. And that there is a convergence, contractual convergence, because essentially this is becoming funded by the group of investors like the giant bond market. And so we should expect that the maturity gets longer and that it gets covenant light. Completely agree with that point, with one exception that it's still an asset class that is sold as a senior secured asset class. It's not priced as a high yield bond. So covenants, it, uh, covenant light or not, that, that's, that's tied directly to, to coordination cost, which is real. But if you're gonna protect, sell something as a senior secured and it doesn't have a protection on the collateral, then it should be priced accordingly. And currently it's priced as a senior secured debt. So, I agree with everything Craig said. To oversimplify, he said loans are bonds now. Okay, if that's true, do we expect, in the absence of the covenants that, you know, the complicated covenants that Professor Avashina was, as a pioneer in analyzing these things, explaining to us, in the absence of those, would we expect the loans to have bond-like recovery rates? Because in my simple arithmetic, you know, if you 
If you lose 25%, everything's good in the CLO market in the next downturn. But if you lose 60%, as is the norm in the bond market, everything's not good. Now, I would say, actually, the loss of maintenance covenants is not enough, right, to give you a 60% recovery because the market's actually more complicated than we, we have said. And as Professor Avashina emphasized, this is really complicated stuff. And that's partly why things that don't smell very good can grow out of the light. I, I think these are all great points and in a sense that uh, convergence is pretty clear that's taking place between these different asset classes. But I think Victoria is making an excellent point that as long as investors understand what they are buying as a pack, what is packaged as a first lien instrument that historically had a 75% recovery, that's unclear. Craig, another question for you is people are making an argument that things are different in the private debt space because oftentimes you don't have to compete for the same transaction for your, at least for your space in the same transaction. Usually you either take the whole piece down or maybe you share it with two or three other investors. Uh, the argument goes that in those arrangements, you're better suited to basically set your terms for leverage, for EBITDA adjustments, for covenants. At the same time, because we're seeing all this capital flowing towards your market, I would imagine there is some competition going on. And how do you see that? How, how much erosion has taken place? Is it problematic or not? Uh, sure. Well, so you're um, you're absolutely right. The, one of the, the reason we uh, we like uh, the format on which we extend loans is we make bilateral loans to companies. Uh, we choose only the loans in companies we want to make. We don't have to participate in the broader market. Uh, we negotiate our covenants directly with our borrowers. We're quite focused on that. The vast majority of our first lien term loans have maintenance covenants, whereas the the uh, syndicated market they typically don't. And beyond the covenants. Um, you know, we get very deep in, in the bowels of the document and, um, and, and care deeply about everything that you, you know, we've all been highlighting is not there. We have purchasing power. We have the ability to say no, and, um, and we do most of the time. Um, there's, there's competition in, in our market, uh, like there's competition in, in every market. Um, it's been a growing asset class, um, but it, it's still a market that, that I think is underserved and one that will continue to grow compared to, um, markets that are, are much more mature with, with many more um, borrowers. Um, you know, just as one frame of reference, um, three of our funds are business development companies or BDCs. Um, if you added up all the assets of all the BDCs that are out there, it's about $100 billion. Uh, the high yield bond market is about a trillion. The leverage loan market's about a trillion. So, you know, just by that one measure, which, which is a gross oversimplification, you can see it's a small fraction of, of the uh, marketplace, and I think you'll continue to see it grow, and our business ha is an example of that. Thank you. Um, maybe just shifting gears to another topic, the topic of liquidity in corporate credit. So that's, um, that's been a, a sort of um, an issue of concern to a lot of investors, because the argument goes when $4.3 trillion go in the direction of our markets, as happened over the last 10 years, we have a well-oiled new issue machine to take care of those dollars coming in. In other words, the material, the investment material is being created to absorb that inflow of capital. That's a liquidity on the way in. There is really no equivalent of that machine on the other side. So when that capital decides to leave, especially when it's not in some token amounts, but in, in more significant amounts. All the parallels you've heard today about alarm bells going off and people rushing for the exit, that's a type of scenario people are trying to think about. What is going to happen on a day when many investors decide to hit uh, the road for the exit uh, for whatever reasons, uh, more or less simultaneously? Uh, just from my perspective, maybe a few data points on, on, on this. Uh, in a normal market environment, let's say, as, as it is today, uh, most high-yield bonds will be trading about quarter point bid ask. So you can buy the same bond basically almost, almost frictionless uh, for more liquid capital structures uh, without really um, uh, exposing yourself to significant trading costs. In a somewhat stressed environment, think about Q4 of last year, you're probably looking at about a point 
of bid ask on the dollar price for liquid capital structures, maybe about five points for less liquid ones. If you roll back the tape to January of 2016, when we had that episode with energy blow up, or go back to uh, European crisis experience in 2011, 2012, a lot of bonds were, they were not quoted bid asks that wide, but realistically the bid ask spread for uh, selling those bonds was closer to 10 points. So I guess any thoughts and views on how uh, the industry will deal with, with the next turn in fund flows? Happy, Please. Happy to jump in. Um, so it seems to me that we should separate the key players here, right? So 80% of the leverage loan market, direct lending or private debt is, has a very different dynamic. But focusing on the leverage loan market, which is by volume is a most important piece here, then 80% uh, is funded by institutional investors on the primary market. The secondary holding could be even ho bigger. Of course, the largest chunk is collateralized loan obligations. And that has a fixed structure. It's not mark to market. It's not runnable. So that immediately slows things down. That market can shut down the way it shut down in 2007, but it doesn't put immediate pressure. Now, the other piece is a mutual fund. That's, that's the problem, right? So the structure that has withdrawals. We've seen it before when the Fed start uh, moving the rates that mutual funds actually act as uh, CELOs actually acted as a stabilizing force for mutual funds. So as long as CELO market is there functioning fine, it seems like those two are touched fine. Banks are out because they cannot provide liquidity into this high yield market. And the final piece is Craig's world. And those guys have uh, expertise. Uh, they have uh, deep pockets. Uh, they have pension funds long-term commitments into, uh, to them. The only problem is that they need to generate at least 8% and they probably will try to shoot for more. And this is a market that generates to 4 to 5, so you can see where they're going to be buying. That's, that's how I see it. <laughs> what do you think about that, Craig? Um, look, uh, we, I agree with all the comments about liquidity. Um, we're not, we don't play in the liquid market. Um, we wouldn't be upset at all if the investors that are investing in liquid markets demanded a higher return for the, um, the lack of liquidity that they'll experience when there's market volatility. So um, I think that's a very fair, um, fair observation, and we've seen that. And I think some of your, you were leaning in on some of your bid asks, right? When this market, when the low market and the high yield market um, experience distress, the, the bid ask, there is no bid, right? right? And um, you know, candidly, uh, you know, we're well positioned for that kind of environment. Not so much, we don't trade, so we, we're not a distressed, we're not going to go into the market when there's lack of uh, buyers and trade in the market, but we'll be there for the formation of the next deal, where now the banks are going to be very reluctant to underwrite that next deal because they're going to see the, the markets are in dislocation, and so we'll be able to get, you know, I'd like to think we're going to stick to our knitting on credit, but we're going to be able to get better returns um, for the same uh, kind of a deal. Um, I think that the illiquidity of the market um, is, um, is, is, is it's accurate, and, um, and I think all the, mar the investment grade market as well. Like all of these markets are not pricing in, um, particularly the mutual fund uh, component of those markets. It's really a mismatch when you have a mutual fund investing in, in a loan market or a high yield market where they're offering their investors daily liquidity and they're investing in, in assets that um, in times of stress, you know, it's very difficult to create daily liquidity. Um, that's clearly, uh, that's not sustainable. And so BDC capital is more or less fixed, right? It's an equity capital. It, 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 it can be sold in the market, but it can be withdrawn. What about capital that goes into sort of separately managed accounts and private debt? How far out, is it usually locked? And is there pressure, again, given, given the competition that's heating up in that market, yeah. is there pressure to reduce those lockup periods? Um, so we, we, uh, we don't have any separately managed accounts, although a number of the folks that are in our space do, so, so you're right to ask about the question. Um, you know, tr traditionally, uh, most separately managed accounts are, are structured similar to that uh, of a private equity fund. So it's committed capital, there's a period to draw it down, um, and then there's a period after which um, capital has to get returned. Um, I'm not familiar with every type of construct, but I think the vast majority are not going to, 
um, allow for um, a, you know really quick unwind where where those separately managed accounts um, have to create liquidity to their uh, to their investors. Mark, any thoughts on liquidity? So I've been watching the leveraged loan market for decades, and you know based on history, something we roughly know, when there's moderate stress, okay, the transaction prices go from near a hundred to somewhere between 92 and 95, okay? And this is the senior secured part of the capital structure. When there's really extreme distress, the transaction prices in, you know, 08, 09 went to 65, and that's an index value now, right? That's the average in the market. So that's got to be a liquidity problem because we're in history and the contracts were the same as historically, and so if we had a 20% default rate, okay, and a, you know, 25% loss, that means I could buy at 65 and eventually sell at 75 almost with certainty if I bought the whole market. So liquidity is going to be a big problem, and it is going to be a big problem for the mutual funds because they have to mark to market, right? And so they're going to show in their daily net, net asset values, these liquidity rated discounts, and that's only going to you know, amplify when people see that in their mutual fund and withdraw. Thank you, and uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll uh, quickly touch on uh, one last topic. Maybe in a few minutes, we'll see if there are any questions. Sure, of course. This is just a breakout of sector distribution of uh, new corporate debt that has been created. This is the last five years. So the left-hand side uh, is ranking it by total capital raised in each sector. That total capital includes both debt and equity. That's a yellow component on the left-hand side chart. Um, the right-hand side chart is uh, basically looking just at, at the debt component, and it shows you the growth rate in debt by sector. What I find really interesting about this chart is if you focus on the top five line items on that list, healthcare, technology, energy, retail, and autos, out of those five, three arguably are already in different stages of restructuring, right? Energy has been dealing with restructurings for a few years now. We've kind of seen more or less a replay more recently, not as, not as deep as it was 2015, but nevertheless, uh, retail, of course, has been a story for the last few years, and autos more recently, where there is a function of uh, trade wars or, or something else, but has also uh, been under pressure. So any thoughts from panelists on uh, what they are um, concerned about, not concerned about, sort of where they see opportunities? Do you want to go first again? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, look, I... I um, I think the lead in you're setting up is is, is our healthcare and, and tech, you know, poised for a similar fate. I, you know, I think the obvious there's obvious differences, right? Energy is 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 really driven by the commodity price. Um, it's a very capital intensive industry. When the commodity price uh, moves as it does, it's very volatile. Um, those companies, you know, get hurt. Auto, you know, is kind of the classic cyclical sector, and um, and everyone understands what's been happening. Um, retail um, technology is an area we're very active in. Um, well, when we, when I say technology, that you know what we focus on are software businesses, and software has become only more and more important to the way every company operates, and the outlook for that, I think most people would say, uh, is going to continue, and the growth rates are extremely high, um, and um, and it's a small portion of the cost of most industries. So, um, I think if you were talking about a more capital uh, equipment part of um, of technology, it might be different, uh, but I think technology, my, you know. We believe are going to, is going to continue to be a growing sector. Portions of it, healthcare obviously um, reimbursement risk is a, is a huge um, factor in healthcare. You know, just this week there was some news in, in certain sectors of the market about potential cuts. So, um, if you're in the healthcare space and, and your and your companies are subject to reimbursement risk, that's always going to have stroke of the pen um, type risk. Um, other parts of healthcare um, similarly will be less cyclical and, and growing. And so, I don't think it's naturally the case. That, um, that those sectors will necessarily follow the trends of the, the other three that you mentioned. If, if there are any questions from the audience, we can, we can take those, please. Uh, 
Uh, hi there, uh, thank you for uh, presenting to us. So uh, if I were to understand the, the way corporate debt has been spread across the different sectors, you know, 60% I think has been, is being held by CLOs, if I recall the, that number. Uh, another, I'm not exactly sure what percent is held by mutual funds and the, the remainder is held by banks due to the shift in leverage lending guidance. One of the things which I'm con uh, not concerned about, I, I also work as a risk analyst, is uh, when looking at, looking at banks, uh, I know they hold typically a tranche of uh, their, their broadly syndicated loans. I wonder how much of a percent that is, number one. And I think number two is when looking at revolvers, I, I, I know that banks typically hold on to the revolver. And right now, revolvers you know, in, in a benign uh, period are undrawn. So as, 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 uh, as the economy begins to falter, and as, as you've seen with distressed credit, the first thing you do is, is draw on the revolver and have as much cash on your balance sheet prior to filing for bankruptcy. So I'm curious about, has there been studies about theoretical potential uh, bank, uh, how much bank exposure, how much bank debt uh, there is theoretically? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, um, on your first question, um, the percentage that the banks hold on, on syndicated loans is zero. It'll be zero percent. They don't hold any. The model is designed for them to distribute all of it, and if they have not successfully distributed all that risk, they will invoke um, what's called flex, which is basically extra rate that they can use to distribute the risk. Um, only in the event that they don't have enough flex might they be stuck holding a loan, but it's designed that they hold zero. They do hold the revolving credit facilities, um, as you su suggest. Um, and you're right, in, in times, if the companies are having issues, the first thing they're going to do is draw on the revolvers. If you went back to the crisis, you know, you, you, would, you would see this. I think um, you could, um, I haven't done this, but if you were, if you were uh, interested, I suspect you could go on to into the 10Ks of the big banks, and they would break out, I think, um, their exposure to um, corporate uh, revolvers. I think the banks are already on to that risk, you know, and they lived through the crisis, and, and um, the sizes of those revolvers have come down. The banks have gotten stingy on extending them, uh, but they, ha they have it um, nonetheless, and so you could kind of go and see, add up how much they all have, and there may be some research out there that, that calculates, uh, calculates all, the, all that for you. So let me add to that. Uh, the revolving lines are an extremely important form of credit, when we, and it continues to be because it's the prim prim primary form of funding working capital. So as of 2007, uh, two-thirds of commercial loans, issued commercial loans, were in form of revolving lines that were sitting on the balance sheet of the bank, of course. Now, here's an important point to consider. So as this reflection about uh, if crisis hits, everybody goes and runs and grabs their revolving lines. Uh, that is an observation from 2008. Uh, but 2008, you have to keep in mind that the reason why you did that is because you were terrified that your bank will not be there to fund that line. Now, loans are variable rate. If you have a cons confidence, and of course in periods like 2008, the cost will go down, right? So uh, if you're confident that your bank will be there and will not default on your lines, then, then that, there is no reason for you to run and grab this because the second you touch it, you will pay an interest rate on that, so unless you have a productive use for it. So I think that extrapolating 2008 to today, you have to consider that 2008 was an environment where Goldman was trading at scary price and several banks were disappearing. And so no wonder there was a mandate for many firms to just draw the line, let, let, let's see what happens. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the context in which we live today. Yeah, just to add one, one, one last thing, and I know um, this might, might throw a, a monkey in the wrench of the narrative that's been here. Generally, in the bank's revolvers, if they're drawn more than a third, they have maintenance covenants. It's a classic covenant, like, yeah. The revolvers, either now or you know, when things get a little bad, are gonna to amount to seven, several hundred billion dollars of exposure. If you add them to the term loans, you're gonna get about 1.8 trillion. It's not very different than Ed's total number in the bond market. So, you know, they're a big deal. Any other questions? Hi. As a follow-up to your question about liquidity when the investors leave the market, it reminded me of a 
um, question I've had and I've never known who to ask, and I thought you guys might be good for this. During the financial crisis, the CLOs had to sell when the loan prices fell, which created a vicious cycle. And I've heard that this has been fixed, and you guys mentioned it, that there's no more, the mark to market has been taken out of a lot of those deals. But I also know that banks lend to CLOs and BDCs, and when they lend, the loans have kind of a borrowing-based concept in them that is based on the value of the loans in the CLO. So that, if, if the prices go down, the borrowing base is going to go down, which means that the BDCs and CLOs will have a liquidity problem. It will have the same problem from the last cycle. I was wondering, does anyone know about this? Has anyone looked at how significant this is? Uh, CLOs um, generally um, fund themselves by issuing liabilities in, um, in the institutional investor market. They're not financing themselves from banks. So that's not, that's not an, it, that, that concern, you'd be right to have that concern if that were the case, that's not how uh, CLOs are financing themselves. They'll have a line of credit during the ramp up phase, right? But that's only at the beginning of their life and it only lasts a few months. So in aggregate, it's not that big a deal. BDCs, it's going to be more idiosyncratic. I mean, they're all going to have a line of credit. I don't know how many of them today we, no, we, use we, uh, it. The, the, all the BDCs have a line of credit, and you can see it. BDCs, because they're permanent capital, um, we have access to the bond market. So you know, our first fund, which is a publicly traded instrument, is investment grade rated. And so we have the ability to do bonds and not be as su not subject to um, the concerns you have. So I I think it's all a fair question, but I think it's not something that is uh, is, is is not understood by by the managers of either a CLO or or a, a BDC, and you know we capitalize ourselves appropriately. Well, I think we can go on a lot longer, uh, but uh, I think a number of people have to a short break for various reasons. Uh, let's thank very much our panel. Thank you uh, very much, Oleg.